Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Ashish Darberry of Axiomize. We're going to talk today about challenges in RISC-V verification. Ashish, when we get into the world of RISC-V, it's a whole different beast, right? It's no longer a lot of this stuff is already done for you. You have to do it all. Absolutely. RISC-V is opened up uh, a whole new space of verification challenges because a lot of the vendors are building RISC-V designs are not the old big houses of 80s and 90s. And therefore, RISC-V open source specification, anybody can make a processor. You can design one in your kitchen, at least a small one. But verifying it, not that easy. And that's where I think a lot of our focus has been recently. RISC-V is, is different because you can customize the instruction set architecture too, right? Absolutely. So that's where the strength of RISC-V is that you can come up with great new instructions that can do the job much better. Also, the verification collateral, we need to make sure those work. And the ones that were working before, those instructions are not broken. So nothing is free, unfortunately. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Ashish, what are we looking at? Right, Ed. So what we're looking at here is the space of RISC-V verification, which includes core verification, which is also known as a processor. But processors are not working on their own, so they talk to memory subsystems, L1 caches, L2 caches, and all the way. So that's subsystem. They don't normally work in the way 90s processors work, where there was a single cache or a multi-level cache, but there's one core. So you've got the problem of tying up multiple cores, usually typically multiple of hundreds in big, big chips. So then you have to use the fabric to connect those cores. That's where some of the interesting verification challenges are. I want to also tell you that once you've done all of that, you might want to connect peripherals to make the whole SOC. So this is an abstract version of the whole world of RISC-V, a sort of 30,000 feet view of it. So in this world, you would have lots of peripherals, but that's the, the theme. And cache coherency is really difficult to maintain, right? Because now you've got two different processors working on the same problem, having to do this, and you need to make sure that they're, they're both in sync. Where does formal fit in here? So there are multiple aspects of cache coherency that makes it very hard. So in the good old days of the pre-ARM era, everything was total store order. So sequential consistency and total store order nicely aligned with each other. But then uh, if you remember, the compact guys were doing a lot of work and that paved the way for weak memory models. Everything in RISC-V is weak memory, which basically means there's a challenge in microarchitecture to make sure that sequential consistency is enforced. But sequential consistency is not a problem of just one core keeping itself consistent with the memory. But because you have shared cache lines between different cores and you have weak memory as well, you've got a lot of problems. And you're talking about high performance chips where actually you've got not a very simple way of sharing the cache lines. So, so the cache lines themselves can get, cache architecture can get quite complex. So those are the challenges. And, and you know, we talked about RISC-V opening up the space of innovation for design and open source. What's this bringing is all of these new creative ideas from designers where they're bring, bringing in designs that don't look like anything we've seen before. So although the fundamentals of coherency have not changed, the way designers implement these on high performance fabrics or let's say without the fabric on a crossbar, that is opening up a lot of nightmare. And simulation isn't able to pick up these things just because there are too many interleavings or which, which is not humanly possible to come up with sort of random stimulus to catch it. So we, we are seeing that in an assertion-based formal verification environment, we can layer these assertions, we can size the environment appropriately for formal tools to then go and find all of these bugs and then we are able to prove that coherency is not broken. This, this is a space for RISC-5 where I think without formal verification, you're expecting a major problem. Either it will be a respin or, or potentially a major catastrophe as well. Are you finding gaps in the tools that are there? Uh, and does formal now fill in a piece that wasn't there before? Formal tools in particular do not particularly have anything specific for cache coherency. What they do have is a lightweight specification template which could be plugged in with some of the tools. And then you have to write some of these assertions or write code to generate these assertions. But the strength of 
of, of formal would come from the quality of the questions that we can ask as a formal verification engineer. And if we can ask those questions, the tool will deliver the results. That's the, that's the flow anyways. What's the learning curve for using formal in RISC-V? You're, you're talking about people that are doing it who are doing it potentially in their kitchen. What does that actually imply? Yeah, so RISC-V design, again, because lots of open source cores are available, people can often look at how designs have been done. They can copy them, adapt them. So, so they can bring up a RISC-V core quite easily. However, exhaustive, comprehensive verification is not uh, particularly easy. So what we did at Axiomize is to build an executable formal verification test bench that can be used for core verification. So the problem that that solves is not the coherency problem, but it actually you can find architectural correctness for the entire core. Now, if you do want to learn how to write these assertions, then, I mean, learning can be done. We do offer learning uh, potential with Axiomize. We do have training courses. There's nothing specific about RISC-V that makes it difficult for formal uh, you know, capabilities. But the challenges in embracing formal for RISC V are pretty much the same as it is with formal for any other design. And one of the things about RISC V is you're typically not using a RISC V chip just by itself. It now is tied into other things too, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So this is where the SOC layer comes really handy. So nobody is making everything themselves. You know, you could be making a processor, but you would be sourcing IPs from one of the other third party companies. And it's not just the functional integrity check, which is that the IPs work correctly, I can send in some driver test, and I can bring up my HDMI or an I2C. But it's also about whether you can trust these third-party IPs, whether there are Trojans in those IPs. Uh, I mean, of course, a lot of the people are not thinking about it. They're only thinking about functional verification. But if you're building anything for um, a high reliability, high security, high assurance environment, and these requirements also become very important. Ashish Darbari, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.